Oh boy, hello. Wow. All right. Woo. Sorry, hello. I love you so much. Oh man, woo. Um, do you like my goth um, gown that I, for some reason, is the only clothing that I brought on this trip? So I packed in four minutes. Um, hi, I'm so happy to be here. How, how's everyone's book festival going? <sighs> so we're real loose this hour, just so you know. Um, I'm just going to read for a while, and then we're going to just uh, do Q&A. For, with you, for fun. I don't know, whatever you want to talk about, within reason. So, um, does anyone have any requests for what you want me to read about? Someone, has it, sex or snacks? <laughs> I prefer snacks. <laughs> you want to talk about snacks? I was just having this conversation. Um, in the, I just did an interview, and the nice lady asked me, what do people never ask you that you would like to be asked? And I was like, I would like to talk about the ranking of snacks, <laughs> such as Starburst, pink, red, and then the rest is garbage, right? Like, or do people have a feeling about orange versus yellow? Orange, slight, like a slight edge, but I still would rather throw them away. And then... Um, Skittles, you got to go red, purple, green, and then again, the rest is negligible. All right, I'm just glad we talked about that. I don't have anything to say about sex. No, actually, how about I read, I'll read my abortion chapter. <laughs> as close as I get to sex in this book. It's so funny because I think people think of me as like an oversharer because there's like, I'm like, you know, TMI, because I talk about period blood and stuff. I really actually feel ve like I'm very private, and I'm like a real, real wet blanket dork, <laughs> and I, have, I am so uncomfortable. I don't like to talk about sex or, like, naked, naked people. <laughs> like, I can't. Like, I'm like a... Um, my husband um, has a mom who's amazing, and she is... Um, She's in her, like, early 60s, and she's going through a sort of, <laughs> why am I talking about this? It's okay. I think she'd be fine, because she never stops talking about it. So she's having sort of, like, a cool, like, sexual awakening, reawakening, like a second wind. And um, she talks about it all the time in, like, the most charming slash I'm gonna, I want to die way where she'll be like, have you heard about this store called Babeland? They have amazing products. And, like, we should take a class together. And, like, the classes are, like, squirting class. Like, like I'm good. Um, and she, she, like, she, for, uh, for new, she fell in with, like, a new crowd at work. And they... For New Year's, she she just like, oh, I'm going to this New Year's party with my coworkers. And then she was telling us about the New Year's party, and it became clear that this was an erotic ball. <laughs> and she was like, <laughs> she's so she's so charming and so cute. Because uh, she also has this sort of like wide-eyed wonder about life. And she was like, there was a there was a man there who was giving uh, free massages. And, uh, and she goes, let's just say, your mama got massaged. <laughs> we were like... So anyway, then there's my mother, my Norwegian, um, like, <laughs> very... She's, you know, like me, but worse. And she was like, so this is happening at Christmas, or... No, I guess it must have been after New Year's. We were hearing about the erotic ball. And my mom leaned over to me, and she was like... I'm so glad I'm repressed. <laughs> I was like, me too. And Sue's like, you guys have to come with me next year. She goes to my husband. She's like, uh -huh, there was a guy there who looked just like you. Except he was only wearing a silver sack, you know, for his jewels. <laughs> Don't say that he looked like your son. It's not necessary. So anyway, um, I don't like it. I don't like talking about dirty things. I'm not against it. I think other people should talk about it. I just um, 
like blush and die. So this is sort of the closest I get as I talk about the the um, the epilogue <laughs> of the, the postscript, which is my abortion. Okay. So this chapter is called uh, When Life Gives You Lemons. I don't keep track of my periods, and I kind of think that anyone who does is some sort of neuroscientist. So I have no idea what prompted me to walk over to Walgreens and buy a pregnancy test. Maybe women really do have a weird spiritual red phone to our magic triangles. Never thought I did, but for whatever reason, that day, I walked around the corner, bought the thing, took it home to my studio apartment, and peed on it. I probably bought some candy and toilet paper, too, as, like, a decoy. So maybe the Walgreens checker would think the pregnancy test was just a wacky impulse buy on my way to my nightly ritual of wolfing Heath bars while taking a magnum dump. Because that's better. I always throw a decoy perch in the cart anytime I have to buy something embarrassing, like ice cream or vagina plugs. Obviously, on paper, I disagree with this entire premise. Food and hygiene are not embarrassing, but being a not-baby is a journey, not a destination. Like, if I want to eat six Tootsie Pops and a Totino's for dinner, I'll also buy a lemon and a bag of baby carrots to show that I am a virtuous and cosmopolitan duchess who just needs to keep her pantry stocked with party pizza in case any Ninja Turtles stop by. (laughs) The carrots are for me, Belvedere. Or, if I want to buy the super economy box of Ultra Plus tampons, I'll also snag a thing of Windex and some lunch meat to distract the cashier from the community theater adaptation of Carrie currently entering its third act in my gusset. (laughs) Maybe I'm just buying these pawns for my neighbor on my way to slam some Turk and polish my miniatures, bro. (laughs) Turk is short for turkey. Pawns is short for tampons. I like, in case you guys aren't up with like the youth. I'm very young. Okay. Um, I did used to have a miniature collection. That that just reminded me. I just I just had a flashback to. Col- did other people collect miniatures? Why? Why did we do that? I think I still have. They're in a box at my mom's attic somewhere. Um, okay. Uh, I remember like. At one point, I was like, I need a, some sort of... I need to display these. And then I did. And then I was like, why? And then it's just like a thing you have to dust. Okay. It has no... You know, like a regular thing, but smaller? <laughs> All right. Important. Uh, important aside. One must never, ever use tampons and Ben and Jerry's as each other's decoy purchases, as this suggests you are some sort of Bridget Jones situation (laughs) who needs ice cream to soothe her menses a blue blues, which defeats the entire purpose of decoy purchases, Albert Einstein. So peeing on things is weird, right? As a person without a penis, I mean. I could show you the pee hole on any crotch diagram. I could diagram pee holes all day, and I do, But in practice, I'm just not entirely clear on where the pee comes out. It's sort of the front area, the foyer. (laughs) But it's not like there's like a nozzle. Trying to pee into a cup is like trying to fill a beer bottle with a super soaker from across the room in the dark on a moonless night. (laughs) This is one of those disheartening moments where I'm realizing that I might be the only one. And I may as well have just announced to you all that I don't know how shoes work. What's the deal with these hard socks, right guys? (laughs) Guys? So I pee on the thing a little bit and on my hand a lot. And these two little pink lines appear in the line box. The first line is like, congratulations, it's urine. And the second line is, congratulations, there's a baby in it. This was not at all what I was expecting. And also exactly what I was expecting. My boyfriend at the time, let's call him Mike, was an emotionally withholding, conventionally attractive jock whose sole metric for expressing affection was the number of hours he spent sitting platonically next to me in coffee shops and bars without ever, ever touching me. To be fair, by that metric, he liked me a lot. Despite having nearly nothing in common, his top interests included cross-country running, Fantasy cross-country running. He invented it. 
let me just explain to you. <laughs> he and his friends would r- r- look, <laughs> they would read the cross country roster of like the incoming cross country teams for the next season for colleges in New England. And they would pick runners for their running, their imaginary running team. And so you like, okay, so, okay, right? It's like cross country, other, I mean, fantasy football or, fa- you know, but it, it was college students who run. I don't know how to make you feel the way that I felt. I had to have conversations about this, like a lot. Like every day we had to, I had to hear about who was, fine, it's fine, okay. They would like draft the idea of real college children <laughs> onto a pretend running team, which is already the least interesting sport. Sorry, okay, whatever, fine, you guys love it. Um, okay, so fantasy cross country running, he invented it. New England, the place. New England, the idea. And going outside on St. Patrick's Day. His, his second favorite holiday after the 4th of July. <sighs> My top interests were candy, naps, hugging, and wizards. Despite that, despite that, we spent a staggering amount of time together. I suppose because we were both lonely and smart. And on my part, he was the first human I'd ever met who was interested in touching my butt without keeping me sequestered in a moldy basement. And I was going to hold this relationship together if it killed me. Um, (laughs) Let's see. God, this is so embarrassing. So many feelings in this chapter. Why did I do this to myself? All right. Mike had only been in official relationships with thin, conventionally attractive women. But all his friends teased him for perpetually hooking up with fat chicks. Every few months he would get wasted and hold my hand or tell me I was beautiful. And the first time I tried to leave him, he followed me home and said he loved me, weeping on my doorstep. The next day, I told him I loved him too. And it was... (laughs) It was true for both of us, maybe. But it was a shallow, watery love born of repetition and resignation. It condensed on us like dew only because we waited long enough. But I have grown accustomed to you because I have no one else is not the same as please tell me more about your thoughts on the upcoming Nezcat cross-country season, my king. I was, it was no kind of relationship, but at age 27, it was still the best relationship I'd ever had. So I God, was I really 27? That's not that long ago. This feels like a really long time ago, and I wish that I had, on the fly, changed that to, like, 19. <laughs> okay. So I set my jaw and attempted to sculpt myself into the kind of golem who was fascinated by the 10K finishing times of someone who still called me his friend when he talked to his mom. It wasn't fair to him either. He was clear about his parameters from the beginning. He pretty much told me, I am emotionally withdrawn and can only offer you two to three big spoons per annum. But I pressed myself against those parameters and strained and pushed until we were both exhausted. I thought at the time that love was perseverance. Mm -hmm. I'm skipping ahead. There's just a bunch of feelings. (laughs) Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I peed on the thingy, and the little pink lines showed up, all, LOL, I hope you have $600, you fertile bitch. (laughs) And I sat down on my bed, and I didn't cry, and I said, okay, so this is the part of my life when this happens. I didn't tell Mike. I'm not sure why. I have the faintest whiff of a memory that I thought he would be mad at me. Um, (laughs) uh, This part's too feelings-y. No, it's fine. I'll read it. Uh, (laughs) Like getting pregnant was my fault. As though my clinginess, my desperate need to be loved, my insistence that we were a real couple and not two acquaintances who had grown kind of used to each other had finally congealed into a hopeful, delusional little bundle and sunk its roots into my uterine wall. A physical manifestation of how pathetic I was. How could I have let that happen? It was so embarrassing. I couldn't tell him. I always felt alone in the relationship anyway. It made sense that I would deal with this alone too. It didn't occur to me at the time that there was anything complicated about obtaining an abortion. 
This is a trapping of privilege. I grew up middle class and white in Seattle. I had always had insurance. And besides, abortion was legal. So I did what I always did when I needed a common legal routine medical procedure. I made an appointment to see my doctor, the same doctor I'd had since I was 12. She would get this whole implanted embryo mix him up sorted out. The nurse called my name, showed me in, weighed me, tutted about it, took my blood pressure, looked surprised, that people can have normal blood, Nancy, and told me to sit on the paper. I waited. My doctor came in. Okay, this is so, I, I read this chapter one other time, and I <laughs> had a re, uh, one other reading, and I noticed when I read it that I wrote, I wrote this <laughs> totally ridiculous thing. So I just told you that I had the same doctor since I was 12, but don't worry, right here I clarified that she's older than me. It just, I wrote, she's older than me. Why? She's older than me. Um, no, yeah, she was, she was 10, I was 12. <laughs> she was, yeah, okay. Um, also, my mom gave my doctor a copy of the, this book and was like, you're in it. <laughs> what is wrong with you? All right, anyway, um, I think I'm pregnant, I said. Do you, wa do you want to be pregnant, she said. No, I said. Well, pee in this cup, she said. I peed all over my hand again. <laughs> You're pregnant, she said. I nodded, feeling nothing. I remember being real proud of my chill tood in that moment. <laughs> I was the fawns of getting abortions. <laughs> so what's the game plan, Doc? I asked, popping the collar of my leather jacket like somebody who probably skateboarded here. <laughs> so stupid. Why don't you go ahead and slip me that RU486 prescription and I'll just moonwalk toward exam room door while playing the saxophone? <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> Fonzie didn't play the saxophone. Did he? he may, maybe he did. I don't know. Okay. Um, I wouldn't be born for <laughs> like many decades when that show was on. So... Um, Sorry, I told you I'm really young and fresh-faced. Okay, she stared at me. What? I said, 100 combs clattering to the floor. Turns out, that's a Fonzie reference. He like, had a comb. Okay. Um, okay, so it turns out the doctor is not where you get an abortion. I'd been so sure I could get this taken care of today, handle it on my own today and move on with my life, go back to pretending like I had my shit together and my relationship was bearable, even good, like I was a normal woman that normal men loved. When she told me I had to make an appointment at a different clinic, which probably didn't have any openings for a couple of weeks, and started writing down phone numbers on a post-it, I crumpled. That's stupid. <laughs> I sobbed, my anxiety getting the better of me. You're a doctor. This is a doctor's office. Do you not know how to do it? <laughs> yeah, I covered it in medical school, she said, looking concerned in an annoyingly kind way. But we don't do them here at this clinic. Well, why did I even come here then? Why didn't they tell me on the phone that this appointment was pointless? You want reception to tell everyone who calls in that we don't do abortions here just in case, no matter what they're calling about? Yes! I yelled. Is there anything else I can do for you right now? She asked gently. No, I'm fine. I accepted a tissue. I'm sorry I got upset. It's okay. This is a stressful situation, I know. She squeezed my shoulder. I went home, curled up in bed, and called the clinic, which had some vague mauve nighttime soap name like Avalon or Des Dynasty or Falcon Crest, still wobbling on the edge of hysteria. Not for all the reasons the forced birth fanatics would like you to think. Not because my choice was morally torturous or because I was ashamed or because I couldn't stop thinking about the tiny fingernails of our baby, but because... Life is fucking hard, man. I wanted someone to love me so much. I did want a baby eventually, but what I really wanted was a family. Mike was not my family. Everything was wrong. I was alone, and I was sad, and it was just hard. The woman on the phone told me they could fit me in the following week, and it would be $400 after insurance. It was the beginning of the month, so I had just paid rent. I had about $100 left in my bank account. Payday was in two weeks. Can you bill me? I asked. No, we require full payment on the day of procedure, she said. 
I felt like a stripped wire. My head buzzed and my eyes welled. I, I don't have that. We can push back the appointment if you need more time to get your funds together, she offered. But, I said, finally breaking, I can't be pregnant anymore. I need to not be pregnant. I'm not supposed to be pregnant. I didn't want to wait two more weeks. I didn't want to think about this every day. I didn't want to feel my body change. I didn't want to carry and feed this artifact of my inherent unlovability, this physical proof that any permanent connection to me must be an accident. Men made wanted babies with beautiful women. Men made mistakes with fat chicks. I sobbed so hard I think she was terrified. I sobbed so hard she went to get her boss. The head of the clinic picked up the phone. She talked to me in a calm, competent voice, like an important businesswoman who is also your mom, which is probably fairly accurate. She talked to me until I started breathing again. She didn't have to. She must have been so busy, and I was wasting her time with my tantrum. Babies having babies. We never do this, she sighed, because typically, once the procedure is done, people don't come back. But if you promise me you'll pay your bill, uh, if you really promise, you can come in next week and we can bill you after the procedure. I promised so hard. Yes, oh my God, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And I did pay as soon as my next paycheck came in. I like to think the woman who ran the clinic would have done that for anyone, that there's a quiet web of women like her, like us, I flatter myself, stretching from pole to pole, ready to give other women a hand. She helped me even though she didn't have to and I'm forever grateful. But I also wonder what made me sound to her ears like someone worth trusting, someone it was safe to take a chance on. I certainly was not the neediest person calling her clinic. The fact is, I was getting that abortion no matter what. All I had to do was wait two weeks or have an awkward conversation I did not want to have with my supportive, liberal, well-to-do mother. Privilege means that it's easy for white women to do each other favors. Privilege means that those of us who need it the least often get the most help. I don't remember much about the appointment itself. I went in, filled out some stuff on a clipboard, and waited to be called. I remember the waiting room was crowded. Everyone else had somebody with them. None of us made eye contact. I recognized the woman working the front desk. We went to high school together, which should be illegal. <laughs> but she didn't say anything. Maybe that's protocol, I thought. Maybe I just wasn't that memorable as a teenager. God damn it. Before we got down to business, I had to talk to a counselor. I guess to make sure I wasn't just looking for one of those cavalier party abortions that the religious right is always getting its sackcloth and a bunch over. Even though, by the way, those are legal too. She was younger than me and sweet. She was younger than me. Uh, I really need everyone to know everyone's relative age. Um, the embryo, also younger than me. She asked me why I hadn't told my partner, and I cried because he wasn't a partner at all, and I still didn't know why I hadn't told him. Everything after that is vague. I think there was a blood test and maybe an ultrasound. The doctor, a brisk, reassuring woman with gray hair in an almost military buzz cut, told me my embryo was about three weeks old, like a tadpole. Then she gave me two pills and a little cardboard billfold and told me to come back in two weeks. The accompanying pamphlet warned that after I took the second pill, Chunks the size of lemons might come out. <laughs> lemons! Imagine if we as a culture actually talked frankly and openly about abortion. Imagine if people seeking abortions didn't have to be blindsided by the possibility of blood lemons falling out of their vaginas via a pink photocopied flyer. Imagine. Uh, <laughs> that night, I ran into a friend and conf I confessed to her that I had had an abortion that day. Did they tell you the thing about the lemons, she asked. I nodded. Don't worry, she whispered, hugging me tight. There aren't going to be lemons. She paused. Probably no lemons. Oh, God. After <laughs> so, yeah, okay, so, ah, uh, man. Uh, afterwards, Mike didn't want to stay over at my place because he had to get up early to go to his high school reunion. <sighs> That was fine, parentheses, it was not. I've got some uterine lining to shed, bozo. I tried to drop him off, fawn style, but he could tell I was being weird. It's hard to keep secrets from people you love, even when your love is shitty. Uh, anyway, then I told him that I had the abortion. He still didn't stay over. <laughs> still went to the reunion, didn't really text me. No lemons came out. I'm just scanning ahead, scanning ahead. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, and then, then we broke up and then he moved away and then my whole life got really cool. So, um, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's kind of, it was amazing. So anyway, um, I hesitate to tell this story. Not because I regret my abortion or I buy into the right-wing narrative that pregnancy is God's punishment for disobedient women, but because it's so easy for an explanation to sound like a justification. The truth is that I don't give a fuck why anyone has an abortion. I believe unconditionally in the right of people with uteruses to decide what grows inside of their body and feeds on their blood and endangers their life and reroutes their future. There are no good abortions and bad abortions. There are only pregnant people who want them and pregnant people who don't, pregnant people who have access and support, and pregnant people who face institutional roadblocks and lies. For that reason, we simply must... Yes, I know. <laughs> don't... Um, for that reason, we simply must talk about it. The fact that abortion is still a taboo subject means that opponents of abortion get to define it however suits them best. They can cast those of us who have had abortions as callous monstrosities and seed fear in anyone who might need one by insisting that the procedure is always traumatic, always painful, always an impossible decision. Well, we're not, and it's not. The truth is that life is unfathomably complex, and every abortion story is as unique as the person who lives it. Some are traumatic, some are even regretted, but plenty are like mine. Most are met with relief. Paradoxically, one of the primary reasons I'm so determined to tell my abortion story is that my abortion simply was not that interesting. Sorry, I just talked to you about it for 20 minutes. <laughs> If it weren't for the zealous high school youth groupers and repulsive birth-obsessed pastors flooding the public discourse with mangled fetus photos and crocodile tears, and more significantly trying to strip reproductive rights away from our country's most vulnerable communities, I would never think about my abortion at all. It was, more than anything else, mundane. A medical procedure that made my life better. Like the time I had oral surgery because my wisdom tooth went evil dead and murdered the tooth next to it. Or when a sinus infection left me with a buildup of earwax, so I had to pour stool softener into my ear and have an otolaryngologist suck it out with a tiny vacuum, during which he told me that I had slender ear canals, which I found flattering. You can watch videos of that on YouTube, by the way. It's so satisfying. Whoo! Um, I mean, it's really gross. <laughs> But it's amazing. Like, okay, whatever. Fine. Don't, we're not, we're, you're not with me on that either. It's fine. Um, it was, it's called, um, <laughs> what's it called? Well, whatever. Just search, like, earwax vacuum. <laughs> There's a million. It was like those, but also not like those. It was a big deal, and it wasn't. My abortion was a normal medical procedure that got tangled up in my bad relationship, my internalized fat phobia, my fear of adulthood, my discomfort with talking about sex, and one that because of our culture's obsession with punishing female sexuality and shackling women to the nursery and the kitchen, I was socialized to approach with shame and describe only in whispers. But the procedure itself was the easiest part. Not being able to have one would have been the real trauma. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, what time is it? How much? We're halfway through? Perfect. That was my plan. So, um, there's a roving uh, microphone over here. Uh, and so, if anyone has questions, um, I'm here. You could ask me whatever you want. Or if you don't feel like asking me questions, I can read some more, or we, I, we could talk about candy. <laughs> Over here. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Lindy, hi. Hi. I'm totally fangirling here. Um, I teach a course on dating uh, for plus size women. Wow. Uh, it's called the Curvy Cupid Course. Oh, my God. That is so cool. Thank you. <laughs> but one thing that a lot of the women that I work with really struggle with is um, how to feel, like, worthy enough to approach, you know, any, I mean, heterosexual women that I'm working with, but, uh, um, how to approach men. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you, like, are married. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was just kind of wondering, could you talk a little bit about... Um, how you started flirting with your husband and, and 
you know, what that was like for you? Sure. So, I mean, I knew my husband for like seven years before we started dating. We were friends. Um, he had two other wives during that time. It's fine. Um, I mean, he w had one when we met. And then there was a brief period of no wife. And then there was a short wife. And then there was no more wife. And then there was me. Um, <laughs> uh, they were both older than me. Yeah, thank you for asking. It's a great question. Um, my husband is four months younger than me, uh, which he reminds me of all the time. He calls me a cougar. Um, so it wasn't like I had to go up to him at a bar and be like, hey. It was like we were hanging out. And then um, it, it was my idea, though. I think he always make, he, he thinks it's a hilarious story. Like, I, I was like... I, I <laughs> we were, we were, had been drinking, and um, I I said something like, I I did like a cool reverse psychology or like a, a trick, a really cool trick where I was like, remember earlier when you suggested that we should make out, <laughs> like, but it, that wasn't true. <laughs> so I'm a genius. Uh, but it worked anyway, and then, and then, then we were now we're married. Um, but uh, you know, I feel like I use I, if you can. The more you can replace insecurity with anger and rage, <laughs> it's really helpful. Um, I mean, because I mean, all that means is that you know that's the process of recognizing that we exist inside of a system, and this system is telling you is assigning you a value that is artificial and that it that has its own agenda and is not in your best interest and i once you start to notice that and acknowledge that and th this way that we that we rank women and that we have very 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 narrow parameters for how women are supposed to behave and i think a lot of that is political and it's used to constrain women's lives you know it's racist it's ableist it's it's a very, very toxic, oppressive system. And once you start to pay attention to that, very quickly this like, oh, I'm gross, oh, I failed, it turns into like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, how dare you do this to me? And that's a really helpful way to get out of that cycle. Because I don't, there was a, a moment where I started to think about this stuff and I, and so much of, um, a, you know, attraction with other people. And this sounds like mumbo jumbo and I, I hate, kind of hate when people say stuff like this, but it, oh, so sorry. But like so much of it is, is the way that you carry yourself. And that's not, that doesn't work in every situation because again, we do live in this totally toxic system. But there was this moment where I, I, I changed the way that I felt about myself and I started to just walk into every room like I owned it. And like, you know, who's going to be lucky enough to go home with me? And it really weirdly was very effective. And then I, but I mean, then those were terrible dark years <laughs> of like bad sex with people who sucked. But um, though that's important to have those experiences, I think. <laughs> it's formative. Um, but yeah, so uh, I feel like um, paying attention, and, and also just having other fat friends is really important. <laughs> like, feel, you know, feeling like you're not, I always was like the, the fat one and then all my friends are like this, this big and like adorable. Um, and so I always felt, you know, like, okay, well, this is their, this is their party and I, and I, I'll just like hang out on the side, you know, and I'm, I've failed. I've failed at womanhood and I'll just wait my turn, which will never come because I don't deserve it. Um, and once I started to question that assumption, it, it changes the way that other people approach you. Um, when you go out like acting like you have value, people are like, oh, does that person have value? Because <laughs> everyone else is caught up in this hierarchy too, and people are trying to place themselves, trying to align themselves with, you know. No, I feel like I, it's not that I think that some people are more valuable than other people, but I, I think that um, everyone has value, you know, except for, um, like the the government. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag <laughs> woke. All right. Um, that was. I know. I'm. I'm. Yeah.
Uh, that was the most pathetic contribution to the resistance. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. More questions? Hi there. I'm speaking of, you know, hashtag woke and the government and all. I was wondering if you could talk about online culture a little bit and how that relates to people kind of working out their social understandings and various forms of rage. <laughs> yeah, you know, I started writing about, as soon as I moved to a national platform, which was in 2012, I started writing for Jezebel. And before that, I got, you can't be, especially a woman who has any level of visibility on the internet without getting harassment, but, but it's a whole different world once you are writing f to people all over the world versus just, you know, people in Seattle. Right, just when I was writing locally in Seattle, it was a different kind of creepy. It would be people like, I saw you at the grocery store and you got a pepperoni pizza, typical. Like, ugh. okay. Like I've literally had like <laughs> online commenters being like, or I found like online forums where someone's like, like anti-fat people forums where they're like, I saw Lindy West at a restaurant and here's a list of everything that she ordered and like in 2009 and I remembered like, okay, yeah, clearly I have a problem. <laughs> you guys are normal. But anyway, so, but then as soon as I moved, as soon as I moved to Jezebel, it was like, uh, you just are inundated with like this rage um, and and you know stalking and abuse behaviors that um, people try to uh, explain away as you know just like that's just how the internet is as though it's not another human being you know telling you that you're too fat to uh, I don't know it's a trigger warning <laughs> basically like my my entire career was like just men telling me I was too fat to rape. Um, that, and, but no, that's just the internet. That's just part of my job that I'm supposed to just deal with, that women are supposed to just deal with. So anyway, a lot of us who were on the receiving end of that kind of constant abuse, which is basically any marginalized person, you know, like my, my black colleagues get constant, constant racist abuse and uh, trans people and um, sex workers and, uh, you know, it's... My, male, my white male colleagues got abused too, but it's just astronomically different when you have any kind of marginalized identity. So um, those of us who were writing about this and, and paying attention to it started to say a long time ago, like, hey, it feels like there's this groundswell of young, white, straight, male rage. Uh, it's, it's really coming at us hard on the internet. And, you know, I was saying in 2012, 2013, like, this has, po this has a political agenda, and it's going to have political consequences. And um, I really wish that people had taken that seriously. Not just me, a lot of people were writing about this, but it was, it was treated as this sort of frivolous problem, like, oh, just close your laptop. Like, well, my job is in my laptop, <laughs> and, you know, I know a lot of people who have, I've had my home address posted on the internet, my phone number, you know, my address where my children live. It's, there isn't really this line between the internet and real life. So I wish that it had been taken seriously, because I think what happened was that um, a couple of things, I think online harassment was really testing the limits of what people would put up with. So, hey, can we hound women and minorities off the internet with hate speech and threats for years and years? And will anyone do, any, anyone do anything about it? And the answer was uh, no, no one will do anything. You can do whatever you want. The America's tolerance for uh, abuse of marginalized people apparently has no ceiling. And it was really emboldening for a lot of people who um, felt resentful of certain social norms that we had, you know, fought really hard to establish, like, you know, uh, d don't threaten to murder people <laughs> and, like, you know, try not to be racist. Um, not that America ever succeeded at that, but, you know, we, there was at least this idea among some people that racism was bad um, and, and, like, racists sometimes pretended to not be racist, which now they don't bother. Anyway, um, so that was really, I think... Im it really uh, validated a lot of people, the fact that, you know, Twitter never did anything. Um, be able to 
make something that just like gets its hooks in people in an emotional way and like tricks them into swallowing challenging ideas. I think that's a really effective way to change people's minds. Is because you know, when you when you get attached to a television show, it feels maybe this is just me, but like it feels like your family. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that sounds pathetic, but um, I really feel that way. And so I have been thinking about moving away from lecturing people <laughs> and toward um, scamming them <laughs> into feeling what I want them to feel. Which is, you know, what, I mean, I'm sure that's not a new idea, but that's what's been on my mind. Yes. Hi. Hola, que tal? Hi. 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 <laughs> So um, I had actually moved to Seattle seven years ago, and after two months, I was convinced that I was the fattest person in Seattle. <laughs> Turns out I was only 13th. <laughs> um, but my question is, so frivolously, what was it like having Dan Savage as a boss? And non-frivolously, how do you establish your space where, in theory, your allies may have their own biases, implicit assumptions, stereotypes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, so, uh, so I used to work at The Stranger, which is a weekly newspaper in Seattle. Um, Dan Savage, who is a famous sex columnist and writer and pundit, um, is the editor-in-chief. So he was my boss for a long time. Um, he, I mean, he, Dan is great at running a newspaper. Like, he, he was... Uh, honestly, <laughs> oh God, um, <laughs> Dan and I are friends. I really respect Dan and I really like him. He's like, uh, he's a, he is not warm. He's a kind of a prickly guy. Um, but he, he was kind of a, <laughs> By the time I got there, he was, like, kind of a hands-off boss because he was, like, famous. So he was always gone. So I guess I can't... He would come to a meeting once in a while and yell at everyone, and then he would go away. Um, but he was really good at uh, defining what the paper was and, keep, like, figuring out how, the right angle on every story, or mostly. Um, he was a good boss. Uh, it was... But it, he was also... When I was there, it was sort of the height of um, fat people are destroying Earth, panic um and he was very into that so he wrote a lot about um the obesity epidemic and how fat people were um lazy and lying about their metabolisms and um you know thin people are better so <laughs> that was difficult and I write about that in the book um because I eventually uh threw a fit and wrote like a manifesto and put it on the blog that was like basically called him a bigot um you know my boss it's fine I don't like people are always like how did you get the courage to do that I'm like I don't know I, it was really it was a really bad idea <laughs> I don't know I don't recommend it don't you shouldn't write a mean letter about your boss and put it up on the blog that he runs it's bad um but I, it was sort of part of the culture of the paper. It was really confrontational and really transparent. You know, if we had disagreements about political issues, we fought it out on the blog. So I was like, well, here we go. Um, he didn't like it. Uh, but they didn't fire me. So I was really popular. Um, so it's fine. But, um, you know, I think it is, it's interesting. You know, the, this is sort of one of the pitfalls of... Well, not the pitfalls, but, like, this is at the crux of intersectionality, right? It's like, you know, that supposedly this, this person is on my team, except secretly he disdains everything. He, he thinks that I am less virtuous, less moral, less smart, more lazy. You know, he, he has these prejudices inside of him because, um, you know, he's bought into the way that our... The, the um, messaging that our culture is really into about fat people. And so um, it makes you paranoid, you know? It's like, who, who do I, who can I trust? Uh, and that, that doesn't just extend to, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, 
supposedly progressive intellectual people who still think that fat people are gross and lazy and not smart enough to be thin. Um, and it's difficult. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you do. You know, I was just talking about, about this with um, Sachi Cole. If any of you read her book, it's really good. It is. Um, she's. It's called One Day We'll All Be Dead and None of This Will Matter. And um, I. she just did a book event in Seattle and I interviewed her and it was we were talking about this thing that happened in Canada recently that she wrote about at BuzzFeed where all of these like huge Canadian uh, uh, media figures, like editors of magazines and newspapers, all had this great laugh on Twitter where they were mad because a guy had resigned because he wrote this absurd thing about cultural appropriation and how it's not real. Um, and all these white editors were just enraged that this man was forced out of his job. And so they started to raise money for an appropriation prize to give money to a, the white person who could culturally appropriate the best. Ha, 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 ha. Meanwhile, you know, what this conversation is about is that, um, you know, there are... Nobody, nobody gives money to, like, indigenous writers who, you know... Um, might actually be able to say something significant about um, the issues in their community. Instead, it's like white people can use indigenous characters in their work uh, and get a bunch of praise and get a bunch of money. Um, meanwhile, actual indigenous people are not hired and are not represented at all. So it's this real conversation that has to do with money. And then all of these white editors were yucking it up and just funnel coming up with their own money to funnel towards some white person so, um, where meanwhile, you know, people of color are pitching stories to these outlets and being told there's no money and they're, you know, we're not interested. So, we're talking about this and it, it is the same idea where supposedly these people are, are progressive and are like on board for the cause, but secretly this confirmed what, you know, people of color in Canada, writers of color always suspected, which is that these editors are laughing at you and are not actually interested in your work and genuinely like think that this is a joke um and so in terms of you know how to deal with that I don't know you know I think you have to um I guess what I've always done is just be really I just never shut up about fat people <laughs> um and then eventually I don't know I don't have a good answer you know, I don't have a good answer. Like, you know, all you can hope for is incremental change and hope that certain people will listen to you and put people of color and put women and put other marginalized people in positions of power where they're the edit. You know, what we, we don't just need writers of color. We need editors of color and people, you know, running these publications and doing the hiring and, you know, um, editing the stories and choosing the angles and deciding uh, whose voices are represented and whose aren't. So, um I guess all you can do is uh, not shut up about it, except that sometimes that has consequences and then people don't hire you. So I, it's the same when people ask me, I'm the only woman in my workplace, what do I do about my creepy boss? I don't know. There isn't, like, this is a huge problem. Like, there isn't a good answer, you know? Unless, unless you have, like, a magical HR department, which most people don't. So, I don't know. If I, I'm... Yeah. Don't shut up about it is the most straightforward thing I can think of. Uh, and and there, there's something about not shutting up, like the actual act itself of not shutting up where people start to be like, you know, if they can't shout you down, maybe you really mean it. Um, and maybe you're not just being oversensitive and you're not being silly. But that's a long game. What time is it now? How are we doing? I feel like I've been babbling for a year. Lindy West, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>